All right, welcome into another episode of the Ryan and Goodman podcast. I'm Jeff Goodman. He is Bob Ryan, and we are joined by uh, one of my favorite uh, people in this business, one of the best people in this business, and that is NBC Sports' uh, Chris Forsberg, uh, who has done a great job here in Boston covering the Celtics uh, for years. Hold on, hold on. Can I, can I, can I start this off? Can, yes. can, like, the only reason I'm in this chair is because of the man who's down here on my Zoom bubble, because I used to go harass Bob Ryan after, after Celtics games while I was at the Boston Globe, and I'd be like, Bob, I know it's 1 a.m., I know we have just uh, finished putting the, the finishing touches on your latest article, but I need you to come talk to this camera for five minutes. <laughs> and he always obliged. I had literally, I have an Emmy award on my wall because I made him talk about Gino on the Jumbotron on one night at like three in the morning. <laughs> and he gave this great soliloquy about the history of Gino and why it met. I'm just saying. So I am honored to be on here. I feel a little bit uh, over overmatched with uh, the quality of talent that is already on this podcast. Oh, I've, I've been overmatched. Scared. I've been overmatched for two years uh, doing this podcast. <laughs> with Bob, so get used uh, to it. Uh, 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 that's very nice of you to say that. Uh, Gino will come up in my conversation over the weekend when I go to the Hall of Fame enshrinement because Garnett is being yes. inducted, and no one enjoyed Gino. No one. <laughs> no one in the stands enjoyed those moments more than Kevin Garnett. When they put that video up, whatever any coach was saying was utterly irrelevant <laughs> to Kevin Garnett. Of course, you know, the game was over anyway, but point is, he just loved it anyway, so I'll think about it. Anyway, thank you. Good to be with you, Chris. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing this hat in honor of Jalen Brown mm. uh, right now. And, okay. and the fact yeah. that we've lost Jalen Brown for the playoffs yeah. And, and how big of an impact uh, that is to the Celtics. I'll throw it to both of you guys. For me, it's big, but they were a 500 team with Jalen. They were a 500 team without Jalen. I don't think they were going anywhere either way. But now it's just like, all right, is there any intrigue into this postseason? Other than the fact the intrigue really is, do they get knocked out in the playing tournament? That's the intrigue now. Amazing that that's what we've, we've come to with this team. But I think with Jalen, I think what's telling to me is that this is the same injury that Romeo Langford had last year in the bubble. And it took him five and a half months to recover, 170 days. And if you do the math, if Jalen gets surgery this week, he'll be back on October 28th if he's on the same timeline. And to me, that's a, a clear sign as any that this Celtics team has started sort of mentally turning its head to future seasons. We heard last night Jason Tatum comes out and says, I had conversation with Jalen. You know, I think there was some debate. Does he try to play through it? You know, with, but with the confluence of that and the ankle and just the utter, you know, disappointing state of the Celtics, I think the general consensus was, hey, let's get this thing right so we're not going through this injury thing again next year. And I think that's telling about where even this team sort of views where it's at and it's middling nature. Of course, Jeff been trying to trade Jalen all year for a grand deal. <laughs> And, and this is going to interfere with that process. Mm. So, no, seriously, if they were involved, if they were thinking about moving Jalen. Well, why back. does it interfere, Bob? Why does it really interfere in a sense that well, you heal from the – this isn't a, a career threatener or anything like that. He'll be ready for training camp. I don't think it should interfere because Jalen Brown was still playing the best basketball of his career. He has made himself into an all-star – He's gotten better in every category that we felt was potentially a weakness, whether it's shooting the ball, uh, whether it's putting the ball on the floor, making better decisions, all of that. I don't think this should – I mean, it doesn't help. I I'll give you that. It doesn't help, but I don't think it's like a game the water a little bit. Someone would have – like someone uh, – you picture the, the conference room at the other end. You know, the other and and the, the, the different voices. Well, I don't know. What about that list? You know, somebody could be. That's all. I could muddy the waters. I should have been more uh, specific. Okay. Yeah. Chris, do you think it has a major impact? Or, Jeff, or can, I, really? can I ask you this? Yeah. I don't think it will. I don't think they were trading Jalen Brown to begin with. But uh, whenever I hear someone say they should just go trade him for Bradley Beal, my, my question is, why are the Wizards trading Bradley Beal? Because if Bradley Beal becomes disgruntled and he says at some point, like so many players do, mm -hmm. you know what? I want to change the scenery. What choice does Tommy Shepard have as a GM? You're going to go out there and try to get another all-star. There aren't that many on the market, right? There are only a few that, that are also going to be on the market. And I'm not saying Jalen Brown is like on the market, like Danny Ainge is calling everybody in the league, you know, hey, we, we want to get rid of him. 
it's not going to be that, but we've seen so many of these players ask out when is enough enough for Bradley Beal in Washington, whereas he says, you know what? I'm tired of just getting in the play in. Like I want a chance to, to, to win. And Oh, by the way, Jason Tatum's like my mm-hmm. little brother. I've grown up with him. I know his potential. I know he and I and Kemba could have a chance to go a lot further than just make the plan, which is what Washington's doing. Will he feel that way when the Wizards eliminate the Celtics from the plan tournament? <laughs> I don't know. It's a good question. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. All I know is that this team has succeeded in making me sound and, and every, every yeah. utterance I had uh, foolish and stupid. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I was, uh, Chris, I was relentlessly optimistic that it would all work out eventually. That is, if, if they got healthy, which, you know, that, that it would all work out. There were just too many good pieces. I still have faith in Brad. Uh, I, you know, I, I was relentlessly optimistic. Uh, I mean, I've closed the book now, you know, I mean, obviously yeah. I, I, I don't, I, I hope they don't go out and play in because I just don't want to listen to it, but I'm like that always. Okay. I don't care what sport we're talking about. Um, I, I just said, oh, God, I don't want to hear all this nonsense around here. And, and so, uh, you know, I just don't want to listen to it. But, but and certainly we all know they could. It, now the season's over. I mean, in a sense, you know, what? and it's a, it is a huge disappointment. And, and let me ask you this. Is there another team in the running to be the most disappointing team in the league? Or have they lapped the field? No, I mean, it's, it's got to be based on expectations versus reality. I think they're, they're at the top. They're like, like if the Lakers fizzled or something, if oh, they no, go the bottom. Lakers got an excuse. Yeah, the Lakers they, have a total excuse. That's true. Them. So there's no, I don't know. When the Lakers are whole, they showed us what they were and what they can be still, assuming that you know Le- LeBron and Davis are ready to go when the when the playoffs start. But no, no, the Lakers. But the Celtics don't. Everybody has COVID. Everybody has injuries. But no team. Uh, just a number. Can you guys confirm this number? Did I hear wrong that they they've had a double digit deficit, thirty nine out of uh, out of sixty nine games? Yeah, and it's something like uh, double digits of number of times they've been down twenty plus points this year. I mean, that, that that's that's embarrassing and disgraceful for, yeah. for, for who they are for, for their talent level that's just I'm that tired. is that, that's a Listen, damning I'm, damning statistic i'm tired of hearing about the amount of games missed i'm tired chris of the excuses i was in for a while on all this and now i'm at the point where like enough with the excuses i get you haven't played with everybody i understand it but again the lakers have been without lebron and ad Donovan Mitchell isn't playing right now for Utah. Everybody's kind of dealing with it to, to some level for the most part. Mm-hmm. And, and this team, no matter what, they should not be looking up at the New York Knickerbockers <laughs> in the in the standings right now. It's an embarrassment to me. And, abs- and how much – all right, so let's play the blame game. Can we Ooh. play the blame game first? Okay. Let, let's do that. Who, who sits at the top of the blame game right now for you, Robert Ryan? Ooh. I don't. I I detest the blame game, and I, I always. This is we're gonna make you play it anyway, whether is, you detest it or not. I, 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 no, I'm 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 a big boy. I take my medicine here, but I don't like this. I don't like it ever. I, and and anyway, I hate to say this, but this is Brad. It's got to figure out something. I mean, we don't want to hear. How many times are we going to hear and have a discussion about about motivation, about uh, effort, about the the, the defense, about. Uh, you know, in the first half, particularly, oh, we're down by 20. Well, let's start playing. And, and a couple of times out, you know, two, one out of five times it works, you know. Yeah, oh, San Antonio, wonderful. The, you know, the guy, a guy has to get 63 to pull you out, you know. Um, you know, that's – no, it's, I, I hate to say it, but I don't know. you got to say, he, he's, you know, he's got to face up some responsibility for this, I would think. I think there, it, it's pretty equal – all around like if I had to, to do my little blame pie which we love on NBC Sports Boston like uh, maybe a third of the chunk is Danny a third of the chunk is is Brad and a third of the chunk is the players you know it starts with Danny Ainge put together a flawed roster and didn't have like somebody at that four position that they could consistently lean on and like look he couldn't have planned for all the injuries they've had but it's clear that when they've had at least just one guy out it's left them paper thin on depth and they've had to lean on, you know, like, look, I like Shemi Ojale. I like Grant Williams, but they haven't been anywhere near consistent enough to carry the, the, the load that they've, they've been asked to this season. Um, all that being said, there is talent here. And when I like, even last night against Miami, there were these two games against Miami, they still have Kemba. They still have Fournier. Like they still have Jason Tatum. There's no reason they should be behind 20 points in what amounts to must have games. So uh, some of that falls back on Brad. Why are they consistently starting poorly? Why hasn't he been able to change that? 
why doesn't this team have any of the hallmarks of Brad Stevens teams, the defense, the ability to fight through mental hurdles and, and obstacles. So, uh, and then the players, like they just haven't played consistently enough to the, the level they're capable of. And it's hard for me to sit here and get on Jason Tatum too much when, you know, he's, he's, I don't, I don't think he's going to get all NBA, but he's in that conversation, but they need more from him. If you're going to be the superstar, you got to be okay with that kind of falling back on you at times. And so I just sort of look around and say it was it, from top to bottom. And, and I, you know what? I throw ownership in there because they don't make the Daniel Tice move to avoid the luxury tax. If they're not worried about the cost of the luxury tax bill into the future. Now, you know, did they know Robert Williams was going to get hurt? You know, maybe you should have planned for that, you know, as much as I love the guy. So I, I just think at every and level. You love, you love Robert Williams? Uh, have you heard? I didn't know that. I had no <laughs> idea. I had no idea. Robert Williams. Bob Forsberg thinks that Robert Williams is the next Bill Russell. Well, Robert Williams is a, is a type of player that this team has not had in the 53 years I've been around them. Uh, the, all right. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you that because I, 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 I missed Russell. I came in a year after Russell. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, I, I inaugurate the post-Russell era and mm -hmm. we're covering the Boston Celtics. They've never had a player of any consequence like this. Uh, this Kevin McHale? Is, Kevin McHale and, and Robert different Williams kind of player. completely oh, no, no, similar? Oh, my God. No, that's, it's diff, this, Kidding. No, different. To, you know better. That, totally diff, not, not the same kind of player. Mm -hmm. I mean, They're complete opposites. Kevin right. McHale and Robert Williams couldn't be more polar. Oh, well, you know, except the fact that they're the same size. But they are, yes. They they're, are. They're, they yeah, are. roughly. And they're, 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 their games differentiate. But anyway, I'm a, I'm a member of the fan club, you know, uh, uh, with the guy. I want him to stay healthy. And, and, and uh, we've seen improvement. And, and, and um, it gives him a dimension. I love that word. Uh, that mm -hmm. uh, they, they have seldom had post-Russell. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, listen, here, here's my deal with Brad. It's so hard for me to say this because, again, you guys know I've known Brad yeah. probably longer than any media person, right? I mean, lucky enough, I covered him when he was an assistant at Butler, head coach at Butler. I covered those runs. Uh, you know, weirdly, I'm here in Boston. He gets, you know, <laughs> he's with the Celtics. So, like, I've known Brad so long, and I love the guy. I'll say it. Like, I know we're supposed to be objective. I love the guy. I, I think he's one of the best human beings you're ever going to meet. I always say, like, you need to pinch Brad Stevens sometimes and, and make sure he's real because that's how good of a human being Brad Stevens is. And I feel like because of that, because of that now, I almost want him out. Because I don't want him to go through what I think he may have to go through next year here in Boston if they don't win. I think he's already getting crucified by a lot of people. And it's only going to get worse. Because I don't see anything changing unless they, again, they move uh, Jalen Brown and make some other moves, right? Jalen Brown and Marcus Smart and get, you know, to me, guys that fit Brad Stevens' system better. See, I, I feel like that's part of the problem here is, yes, Danny H hasn't given Brad enough of the players that he needs for his system. And also, Brad hasn't altered his system, understanding that Danny H hasn't given him the players he needs. You know, it's kind of like Fred Hoiberg when he took over in Chicago for the Bulls. They gave him Paxson and, and Gar Foreman gave him like Jimmy Butler, Rondo, and Dwayne Wade. Three guys who couldn't shoot the ball, really. And like, what is Fred Hoiberg? His whole offense is based around guys that have to be able to shoot the ball. So you were setting him, him up to fail. I feel like Danny's done that a little bit, but Brad also has to adapt a little bit and say like, no, we're not going to shoot 42 threes on a night when we're, you know, like Marcus Smart, if you're, if you're making your first couple, keep, keep launching. If you're over your first six, you're done. You're done. There's a reason why you're wide open every time you shoot the three. There's a reason they want you to shoot the three, Marcus. You know, same thing with Jalen Brown. And I know he shoots a good percentage, but they'd rather him shoot the three than drive to the basket. I, I just, the blame game to me, like you guys have said, is is kind of slithered into a lot of different pieces. And I think Brad has to share as much a part of the blame as anybody. So first off, don't feel bad for Brad, because even if this thing ends sour, uh, he's going to find a plum gig at some great college and be great. No, at he's not he going to college. He's not going to college. Chris. No, no, no. And, 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 and I mean, he's uh, going we all to know the he, he is su supremely motivated to the, the, the whole buzz. As soon as he took this job was college coaches don't last. 
there's a reason he's, you know, he wants to stick around. He's supremely loyal to, to the program. Uh, and, and so I, I don't, I mean, he'll, he'll be fine. I promise you if, if it does go sour, I always think about what, what Doc Rivers said and the whole eight to 10 year thing where, you know, sometimes you just need a change as a person. Uh, I think we all feel that way sometimes, but you know, pop is able to, to weather that and it's, it's rare Spolstra now, but um, it takes a unique set of circumstances. The one thing I would say is I think Brad is a, is a phenomenal coach. I do not think he's the biggest issue this year. I would like to see them go maybe get an offensive minded assistant, you know, someone who can say, all right, here are the pieces we have. Maybe this would work. Maybe we can shape it a little differently. Sometimes when I watch like the way Spolstra finds the best way and like, look, he's blessed with great drafting and the shooters they've got, but you know, especially in, in certain years, I think they could really benefit from that. Brad can make his bones on the defensive end and you know, that's his hallmark and certain, not obviously not with this team, but um, I think there's ways to do this without necessarily having to, to tear it down. Hi guys, Cedric Maxwell here. I want to take a minute to tell you about Marigold Medical. I'm used to keeping my body in great shape, but with arthritis, even the most simple everyday task became unbearable. As soon as I called Marigold Medical, I knew I was in good hands. No drugs, no surgery, just an experienced team of caring professionals that wanted to get me back to doing the things I love. Make the call to Marigold Medical and get back to pain-free life in a season had more variables than all right than so what do you else. what do you do chris what do you are right, you're danny ainge you're danny Ainge. i'm going to start with you chris and then bob you can be danny Ainge after uh but we're going to start with chris being danny Ainge because uh well he's the guest on the show are we are we, are we are, is wick allowing danny Ainge to be danny Ainge this yes. off season yeah yes. so okay i think so too and um i think they're not going to overreact to again like the one of the weirder seasons in history but i do think you're saying like hey get this thing right, or we do have to make tough decisions. I don't think anything happens with the core, barring a Bradley Beal popping free or some elite superstar that they do have to consider. But I do think what Bob said, you know, the Jalen Brown thing does add a layer of complexity to, to any deals. I don't think they were trading him anyway, but it does, if, it, if the opportunity pops up, it's not as easy as just making that deal uh, quick. And I think the Celtics ultimately would have to throw in a whole bunch. I think it starts to come around. What are the best pieces that accentuate this core? Is if Kemba, the Kemba we've seen the last couple of weeks, who's starting to play to a better level, is in a more normal season, is he capable of sustaining that? Can his knee hold up as he's now 31 years old? So that's a tough decision. And it might come down really to what's the cost of moving Kemba? Do you have to give up multiple first round picks to get a team to absorb that salary? Are you able to take back another bulky contract that maybe comes off the book sooner or somebody that fits as a better playmaker alongside the Jays? You know, and then you turn your attention to Marcus Smart. All right, like the payroll is going to get out of control here in a hurry. Jason Tatum's extension kicks in. Uh, Jalen's going to get a little extra based on his all-star year. Um, are you willing to, 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 to keep him around at the number it's going to cost two years out? Um, or do you move him now? Is he a part of this core? Fournier, resign. I like, it all comes down to assessing the complementary pieces. I like what I've seen from Fournier. Do I want to pay $20 million a year for it? I'm, I don't know. Like, I don't know if that necessarily, if, if, if when can healthy you, that. Chris, can you pay $20 million? You can because you saved enough money this year that you probably can't use the excuse that it's the the the, the luxury tax is getting too high. But it does if if Evan Fournier gets twenty million, then Marcus Smart and Tristan Thompson are probably packaged and dealt for something else. Or Kemba goes out for a, a slightly lesser player. So it's all part of the puzzle. But that that's a big payroll, and it's going to be. I think they're already like in the top five of payroll for next year before Fournier signing. And so if you're not part of that elite core. When this thing gets going, then that's when, I mean, from, from ownership down is going to say, we need to make some changes to get this thing to a level where you are competing. So to me, it's work on the fringes, but still a lot of tough decisions. Well, this is a game I hate playing. I told you, I hate all these games. I'm not good at this. I'm really not. Uh, first of all, I don't know. See, unlike Chris, unlike you, Jeff, I don't know the contracts numbers. I don't have, I'm not on Chris top. Chris will help you with that. Chris, uh, Chris very honest, you the I don't have any idea. So I, I could propose something to be completely impractical because of the, the whole contractual situation that I do not know. So, uh, but, but in terms of sheer personnel, you know how much I have, Jeff, uh, clung to Mario. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I have nominated myself not only as a, a member of the fan club, but a, an officer in, 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 in the hierarchy of the Marcus Smart fan club. But uh, that, you know, maybe you do have to 
Now, one more year, one more year at about 14 million, right, Chris? Someone yep. else is equally in love with him as I have been myself, to someone and another team. And 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 then what, what what is this for? For what? I don't know. But uh the thing about I'll just go back up for a second. My big complaint for two, three years was simply that I like the core, but that I, you know what, how many times have I said nobody on the bench was a registered jump shooter? Mm-hmm. You know, an instant offense guy. They tried to rectify this with Fournier, and it looks like it wasn't a bad idea the way he's playing now. Uh, Jabari Parker has been inconsequential so far, and, and uh, you know that that's apparently was a, a whim. It didn't work out, or was not going to work out. But uh, they needed that. If they had had what Fournier is doing now, if they had had that in addition, you know, last couple of years and judicious moments, strategic moments, they might have gone even farther. Well, anyway. And so they rectified that to my degree, to my mind. But this, I'm look, guys, uh, this whole defense thing, okay? Yeah. Um, th- th- this disturbs me, and th- th- I don't have an answer. That they have been, they have been proven in the past they can rouse themselves to play adequate to pretty damn good NBA defense. And what is going on? I don't know. I don't know. One thing was what thought. Um, I haven't answered your question since I can't, by the way. One thing that was roaming through, uh, uh, rummaging through my mind when I was listening to Chris earlier, uh, and, and just think, and you too, Jeff, just a couple, what, I can't even remember what it was two years ago or three years ago, the Rozier year, the year, the, you know, the cut. And we loved them. It, they they played they hard. I would, they were, I, you I know said what they, did? That, they played hard and they played with emotion. Yeah, like I they, love they were having fun. I team. This team does not look like it's having fun. I said this to somebody the other day. I said, like, I don't think Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown dislike one another, but I just can't tell that they love playing with each other. Like, neither one, you don't see those dudes like chest bumping each other after making a big play. They don't make life easier for one another, and they need to. Like, that's the thing that, to me, bothers me about those two. They've been together for so long now. They came up together for the most part, and they don't look like they've ever really played together. Well, that's that's you know that, that's interesting. You know, you're right to a degree. I mean, I can't argue with that. Uh, but I was just going to finish the thought I had earlier, just to but that team that year. I live in a hockey town, okay, and I have no, the only time it was the first time since the bird, the height of the bird era and of the big three era that I heard basketball chatter in this town, in the coffee <laughs> shops, in, in the convenience store, mm-hmm. around uh, in the spring, such as there was with that team. Yeah. And and uh, it was an overachieving team maybe, but it was below, it was really fun. It was, you're proud of them, you know? It was like, a, you were from like it was your high school team. And that, that's what you want ultimately as a fan. And, and to think that they had that at that point, and then we're talking in the terms we're talking now, and we're assessing a season with some of these horrifying games and was last Sunday the Nader uh, down 26 and getting booed off the court of the mm-hmm. half or do they still have something in store for us <laughs> oh no even worse oh, no. I don't know <laughs> playing trying to make her get ugly <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's, it's such a, a a frustrating conversation it's just a, a conversation you never would have thought you'd be having at least certainly at the start of this season no. so do you Bob do you keep do you keep Brad do you I mean listen you're you're at the point where I know you're still far more reluctant to make a move on Brad than I am now. I, I'm, I'm there. No, I'm I, at I, that I like point. What you said. I like what you said about wanting to save Brad from this inevitable, you know, this potential yeah. uh, stink, you know, that could be, if yeah. they, if, uh, that, that's going to emanate from all this. I would have, you know, the, I, like that. I would get him the job with the Pacers. But, I would um, get, seriously, I would hope the Pacers, do you know, I, I don't know what the deal is with this, Chris, you probably don't either, because again, Brad's is, Brad's agent is his wife. So there's not a lot of leaks out here with this contract, but would there be an offset if Brad did go to the Pacers? Would there be an offset where they wouldn't have to pay him? I'm assuming he's making in the in the area of like five million a year, and he's got four more. Years. Oh no, it's it, it's way up. It's above that because I think his last deal was at six million. I think he's up probably closer to seven, seven and a half on the extension he signed outside the bubble. And that was for essentially kept them in there for six more years. Now, some of that could be, you know, just extending the three more years on the end of that deal. My, my immediate thought is uh, when the Celtics traded Doc Rivers and got that draft pick. I, I, what I was saying is like, I think they could they could potentially make a trade and, you know, his deal could get picked up by Indiana or something like that. But 
Um, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think... see Kevin Pritchard and, and Danny Ainge making a trade. I don't know how <laughs> they are after the, uh, the whole uh, Miles Turner situation. Yes. yes. Mm, I, I, don't, I don't know that's going to happen um, smoothly. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so, but I do see that being the perfect situation, right? The Pacers are struggling. They, they've underachieved too this year. Um, certainly. And Brad going back home, you know, to Indiana, like it makes a lot of sense. But this is uh, home now. Like, I, I I get what you're saying, but his kids have lived like 90% of their lives here now. This is where they go to school. Like, I, I just, I think I can see him sort of adjusting or addressing like his future when Brady gets to college or Kinsley gets to college. But I think in this situation, it's more like, you know, and I know we all kind of like ran with the whole, oh, I'm a mass hole now. I drink Dunkin' Donuts and all that. But like, I think there's some truth to that, you know? But if he doesn't have a choice, I guess what I'm saying is, Chris, if he knows the handwriting is on the wall, yeah. And Danny Ainge goes to him and says, "Hey, you know what? Here's the deal. Uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna buy out thirty million. We can't right. afford to. But but next year, send, yeah. if you can find something, let's have a candid conversation. If you can find something like the Pacers that will give you a fresh start, and we're off the hook for you know out of the twenty eight million or whatever it's gonna be, we're off the hook for half of it. Go take it." Can we just say how preposterous it is, it is that we went that from going from you know three Eastern Conference finals in four years and this idea that like Brad was going to be here in perpetuity. Yes. And now we're like, well, you know, maybe if they could offset language in his contract. No. It's just so weird how things can change in, in one really oh. disastrous, ugly season. One and a half. One and yeah. a half. Yeah, that's fair. The bubble, the bubble wasn't great either for them. Let's I mean, they went to the I Eastern mean, Conference Finals. They did. Um, they, the expectations were, were it's weird because the expectations going into the year a year ago weren't that mm -hmm. high but then as Tatum became Tatum then then they, they yeah. and again I still tell people like if Gordon Hayward's healthy I think they beat Miami at this point last year gentlemen remember they entered the bubble playing great and Hayward was everybody was saying this is it this is why you got Hayward he's yeah. distributes he's, he's a perfect fit with these other guys with blah 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 you know and and then he got hurt which he always does he's hurt now yeah. <laughs> it's just so like, it's going to be ironic when he comes back for that Charlotte Boston seven eight matchup and uh, him and Terry Rozier somehow run you off the court and I mean you want to talk about you you asked how it could get worse oh. Lose, losing to, <laughs> lo losing to the former Celtics and Brad Wanamaker hitting a game winner or something that would be uh that would be about the the coup de gras. Yeah, no, I can't. Oh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> so ooh, so you, you guys both would say, hey, you're not tra trading Jalen Brown for anything, including Bradley Beal. Like, if I told you. If I, if I gave you the scenario where you didn't have to part with Bill Russell, you know, Robert Williams, Love but it. you could do, you could, you could get Brad Beal for Jalen Brown, their first round pick this year. And let's say Romeo Langford. I don't think this, I don't think the Wizards are doing it. I think right. you're going to have to. All right. Aaron Neesmith, Aaron Neesmith. How's okay. that? I, I mean, I still don't think the Wizards are doing it. I think the Wizards are going to hold out. Like, I think they want Jalen Brown in multiple first-round picks. Like, Bradley Beal is – I know he has his flaws, but he's also potentially going to be the scoring champ here. He is still youngish. Uh, you are getting the guy who pairs perfectly with Tatum and ensures that he's going to be around long-term. So I think like Tommy Shepard's no dummy. He would be there and, and trying to get as much for them as possible and trying to set up their future with not just the young player, but picks. Sure. Um, I don't, I, you know, again, it would have to go really bad. I thought the wizards would have to bottom out, um, or not, you not even bottom out. Cause then we would have had a pick, but like, yeah. you know, be, be mediocre eighth pick in the draft. And I'm, just with no, you. I'm totally with you. I think the wizards but, but, but here's where we're too well, every off season we say, Oh, there's going to be no star available. And every off season, a star becomes available. So who is this year's James Harden? Who is this year's, you know, it could be Beal. Be Listen, it yeah. could be Beal. If they sneak sure. into the playing game and, and maybe he doesn't, Listen, how many guys love playing with Russell Westbrook? Like, they love the competitiveness. Right. And, I, and I've actually been told Beal and Russ get along well. However, still, you've got a ball-dominant guard there. And I don't know. I, I just think Beal fits better with the Celtics. If you put him with Tatum and, and Kemba, see, I've seen Beal since he was 15 years old, and I know he can move the ball. And I know he's got a really high IQ. And I know he's not – like the greatest defender, but he's, he's an above average defender. And I know he's a better shooter than his numbers would indicate right now. Um, all of that. I think he's just a better fit. And I also think you have to shake something up. You can't go in. So mm -hmm. what are you going to do? You can't go in with the same group. You can't say, all right, yeah, we're going to add 
I mean, again, like, what are you going to, even if you trade, I think per, somebody, somebody was talking last night when I was listening to you guys about Marcus Smart and, and what he could bring. I don't know if it was you guys. Or, I heard it somewhere. It was like Marcus Smart's going to land you some all-star. And I'm like, no, like Marcus Smart is a complimentary piece. That's what he's going to bring you in return. Trading Marcus Smart by himself is not going to get you anything significant. To me, again, you've got to trade one of – well, it's not one of. You've got to – if you want to shake it up, you have to trade Jalen Brown. Jason Tatum is untouchable to me, untouchable. Jalen Brown is not. He's not. I have a little side. Are we setting up, gentlemen, for a final day reenactment of George Gervin and David Thompson for the scoring title? Yes. <laughs> It Did could be fascinating. Care? Are they? Are they? Didn't, uh, people, didn't people care about the Ice Man against David Thompson? I'm not sure they care about this one that much. Oh, I don't um, know. If Steph Curry has a chance to get the record, they better put that in prime time on Sunday yeah. night. Let him. Let him gun. Knowing he's got to yeah. get like 52 or something. That would be fun. Oh, You're that'd right. be amazing. That part of it would be fun. They 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 boost the ratings on that one for sure. And and hey, Bob, while we're on the, I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but Chris will Chris will enjoy this this question and this answer from you. Where do you put Steph among the most exciting players you've ever seen play, Bob? What he does is still uh, astonishing to me, having watched, you know, the game my whole life and, and seeing this evolution of the three and, and seeing what he does and he, what the things he routinely does. Uh, for me, it's very exciting. And, you know, I hate the three, but if you're going to have it, I want it in his hands. Now, last night he was one for 11, by the way. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's going to happen every now and then. But some Thank of the stuff he does, I, for me, it's very exciting. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of ex exciting players, you know, I mean, uh, kind of thing. And, and, and um, you know, uh, it's a short list of guys that I, really that I'm thinking about that I put in that category as opposed to being efficient and just great at what they do. You know, um, I, got, I got more of a list of, of, of uh, efficient, uh, robotic, mechanically tremendously sound players than I do electrifying players, you know, um, but, but what he does and what I, to me, the most, what I, I love when he does, which is not only is he the best long range shooter that's ever drawn a breath in the history of, of planet earth, he can go to the basket with mm -hmm. such spectacular uh, ease, left hand, right hand, uh, I love it when he goes to the basket and, and put the, does some of this stuff and makes it look so casual. So I put him very high in the list. I tell you that. Chris, is he number one for you? Oh man. Like, I mean, you, you're asking me to put it. I, I mean, Robert I Williams is number one. I mean, Robert I Williams is number I one. Like I do, I do. I mean, electrifying. He fits the category. I mean, I, as it, uh, I tried to go to, a, I, I think the only game I tried to, to scout my way into as a kid, my aunt and uncle took me to a, a Chicago Bulls game because I was so desperate to see Jordan. And uh, he was a DNP, essentially load ma load management from that era at the end of a season. And I, I remember thinking, yeah, this is that set me up on a path to, to my load management career. Um, but like, I mean, no one has ever had to be picked up at 40 feet in the NBA. And I know there's others that are starting to do that and Trey and all that. But Steph's just a different beast. The, 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 the rapidity with which he gets off his shots is just absolutely absurd and uh yeah it's uh, even when they're even when the warriors were not very good at times this year you still watch those games because there's going to be absurd moments with him and uh i know he's getting a little bit older now but uh i just keep hoping he can find a way to to, to keep shooting like this until he's until he's 40 yeah I, I love stuff i mean i love stuff on the court and i, I love stuff as much off the court like that's i'm also jealous of his golf game like uh, anyway, I, I always have this rule that someone shouldn't be very good at like too many things. And like, it's what makes me mad about Danny Ainge. Like Danny Ainge could have been a baseball player. He was an amazing basketball player. And then he goes out and shoots 67 at Pebble Beach. And I'm thinking, this isn't right. right. Like you, there should be a cap on how good you can be at you things. Know how so many times I've said that in my life. I love that. Uh, 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 Woody Allen can play the clarinet. That's not fair you know, <laughs> at, a, at a professional level. I, I went to see, and when Meryl Streep sang her own songs in Postcards from the Edge, it freaked me out. That's not right. That's Meryl yeah. Streep. She should have one talent. She's got, <laughs> I, I, you're right. Oh my God. I saw, and I totally agree with you. One talent's enough for everybody. Bob, you have multiple talents though, writing and TV. You have multiple oh, okay. talents. Uh, uh, far from a polished TV person. Uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll hang my hat on the writing. <laughs> um, 
All right. So, so again, we've kind of gone through it. Let, let's, what, what are, do you guys want them to bow out early here? Do you want them to be done to get the highest draft pick they, they've been able to get? The one thing I'll say to that is just because they get pick number 14 instead of 18, let's look at Danny Ainge's tr recent track record of like picks in that 15 range that Chris, they haven't, you could probably rattle them off better than I can, but yeah. uh, where, where did, where did I boy you, you Vaselli or whatever his name where yeah. was the <laughs> I was, I was going to say, so the ones that jumped them out immediately are, are Yabu, yeah. Zizic, uh, James Young, Romeo Langford. They've, uh, they've had some questionable in that 16 to 20 range. Now, all that being said, they got Terry Rozier there. Uh, they just get Aaron Neesmith there who when given the opportunity has uh, made it a little bit easier on me to stop obsessing about the fact that they didn't get Sadiq Bay. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm, I, I don't know. They've got Robert Williams there in the, 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 the late teens and, uh, you know, go way back to Avery Bradley and stuff. It's, it's all such a dart, dart throw. I agree. I don't think like, I don't want them to bow out of the, the play in tournament early just because they can go from say 16 to 13. Um, even with the flat, this even with the flat. It, 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 it means, it means little at that point. Right. You don't know who's going to be there. Right, exactly. The now, board again, could be. They missed out on hero two years ago. That was a tough one when they had Langford one yeah. spot uh, behind hero that hurt them. But generally, I don't know how much of a difference it makes from 13 to 16. No. And so I, I know, I know it's hard to get excited about what's ahead, but I am a little, like I was a little bit curious going into that second Miami game. Okay. Jalen's done. You know, this team doesn't have that burden of expectations anymore. There's no sense complaining about the injuries anymore. Would they play looser and freer? And for the first half of that game, I was like, Ooh, you know, maybe they're just going to try to play fast and do crazy things and, and just see what happens. And then the second half came around and they just forgot how to play defense again. And so I, I don't have great expectations, but you know, I don't have great expectations that they can ratchet it up in a game that matters based on the last two games, but you know, they could, they could get, they could draw a Nets team and, and at least push them a little bit, but I don't think they're, I just don't think they're getting out of that first Do we round. Want to see that? Do we even want to see them against the Nets? Ky like Kyrie, Kyrie getting a victory. So yeah, I don't know. Like do you, you avoid getting knocked out by Gordon Hayward and the, and the former Celtics all-stars, but then you have to go watch Kyrie uh, get some momentum on a on a potential title, yeah, that. it's 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 uh, no, there's no way these playoffs play out well unless the, <laughs> some real crazy magic happens. It's just a matter of degree. So what what uh, negative circumstance? It's going to be a negative circumstance. Just a matter of degrees. How bad? We're not going to enjoy it. Period. I don't. I you, you, do you want to leave lose in the play-in game? No. But but boy, did we, you know, you're right, uh, Jeff. I don't want to see Kyrie strutting. <laughs> it's just, he could wipe the floor with them. Like if they get hardened back which it sounds like he'll be back by then. At least yeah. he's saying that. Um, do you really want to – I mean, they'll, they'll be overmatched. Again, I mean, listen, Kemba's playing great right now. And, and I do love the – I wish the Fournier thing had happened earlier mm. and, and they had gotten a full year. Yeah. With, with, with all four of these dudes and Robert Williams. Like, I, I'm there, and, and I do go there of, like, thinking the what-if game. Of course. But I also am, like – a realist of, you know what? Do we want to go back in with the same group that I just don't think those top three players fit well together? No, no matter what else you add, I just don't think they complement each other well enough. And, and and I don't think the chemistry is great. Again, like I love Kemp. When they got Kemba, I was the first one to be like, this is the greatest thing ever. They got rid of Kyrie and they got the anti-Kyrie, right? They did. I mean, they got the, he is the, the nicest Complete kid, off. the best teammate, always smiles. Like, I saw him smile more in, in, in one quarter than I saw Kyrie smile in his entire career in Boston. But ultimately, the, the problem is Kemba isn't really a leader. He's just not. He's quiet. He's kind of to himself. Now, he'll talk, he's great, like, talking to guys, but he's, he's not going to be a vocal leader. So who do they have that can lead? Well, they don't really have anybody. Tatum's not ready. And that's not his personality. Jalen Brown's not ready for it. He may think it's his personality, but I don't think he's ready for it. Brad Stevens isn't a vocal get up in you coach. And there's nobody on the staff that's that either. You were saying bring in an offensive minded assistant. Mm -hmm. I agree with that, Chris. I would also say bring in a, 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 a you know what type of right. assistant to get up in these guys. Or what I said was trade deadline, go get PJ Tucker. 
Mm-hmm. You can go get uh, Udonis Haslam. Did he yeah. just did he is he gonna is he gonna collect a check for the entire year without playing? Like is he a glorified assistant coach at this point? Brad went on record last week as saying he would get him in a game. I mean Brad. Brad I mean Eric Spolster. Oh, yeah, he went on record as saying he would, but it uh, it hasn't happened yet. I would take him. I would take him. I, it, Give me, give me that final roster spot. I'll pay him or just make him an assistant. Again, like I love Evan Turner, but that's not going to be Evan Turner's role, right. right? Like you need a guy that is, and Evan's really respected, but in a different way. You need, you need a little bit of, of, a, of a killer, a guy who's been there, who, you know. You just need someone who isn't afraid that to hurt feelings, right? right. And I don't think Evan Turner is afraid to hurt feelings, but he's a little bit more of that laughy, jokey type. And so if you're going to have an next player on the bench, have it be someone, you know, I mean, like we all fantasize about KG, MF and everybody and being in, you know, but um, there's people out there like that, that they could, that they could find. And I don't, you know, I, I don't know. In, in this modern NBA, I, I'm less bullish on the idea that that has to be a thing. I think guys are a little bit temperamental. I don't know how Jason Tatum would respond to that, but um, I have seen him play mad recently, and it seems like it does bring out a little bit of better player in him. So I'm curious. I just think something needs to change. Yep. Ultimately, can't. you can't go in with the same group. You can't. Fair. Like, Fair. if you do that, you're setting yourself up to me again, not just Brad, but Danny. Like, it could be cleaning house. If you go in with the same group next year and we have similar results, like, at that oh. point, is it just like clean house? And we've heard – I don't know how much you've heard the rumors, Chris, and, and you can speak to this more than I have. I haven't talked to Danny in a while, but like, you know, is Danny with, with some of his health issues over the last few years? And, uh, you know, is he close to being done as the GM? I don't know. Every time I talk to him, he seems invigorated. You know, he's still he's still getting his holes of golf in, and I think he's still motivated. Look, I think everybody here is, is eager to, 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 to figure out how to get this thing to the level it should be at. Um, you know, can I see – if things go bad again, them saying, Hey, Danny, you're going to, you're going to oversee this thing. You're the super vice president of basketball operations. And there's a GM ahead. I, you know, whatever the stupid titles would have to be. Um, but you know, uh, I, I still don't think that's, that's the first move. I think you give this, you give the guys in charge right now, a chance in a more normal season, figure this thing out. And hopefully we're not sitting here in a year saying, uh, you know, who's, who, who does the, the coach they need to go get and the GM and, and all that, but you know, certainly part of the conversation. The, the other one is if you make a move on Brad, who do you hire? Yeah. Right. That, who do you hire? I mean, that, that that's a big question. Cause I think you probably need, you need a different type of voice, right? You don't want, listen, the old Rick Carlisle wouldn't work. We know that like Rick Carlisle, Bob knows super well, like the old Rick Carlisle doesn't work these days. And he's admitted he was on our pod that he had to change and adapt like everybody else. Would, would somebody like that? And he's not leaving Luca. That's the problem. So you're not, you're probably not getting Rick Carlisle here. Um, but isn't it somebody like that, Bob, that they probably would need to bring in that maybe a former player who has um, a little bit tougher voice or, 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 or maybe yeah, a little that's more the theory. I mean, that's the, that would be the prevailing theory, you know, because people still wonder about how tough Brad Stevens can be or ever is. And, 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 you know, we're, I, we just, we just don't know for sure what happens behind those closed doors, but uh, yes, that, that would be the theory. I'm sure that would be the popular theory. Is there a guy out there? But that would oh. talk. Well, I mean, I'm saying that that would be the popular um, yeah. fan and media theory. We don't know what the, right. what the, what the, the, the um, hierarchy of the Celtic theory is uh, who's out there. I don't know. I mean, I, that I'm going to yield to you guys on that one, but, but uh I, so many assistants get hired now in the league that I, I don't know. I don't think you can hire some yeah. analytics no, assistant. No, no, no. You're, right. you're, looking, you're not going to, no, you know, we're, we're not looking for the next uh, uh, Steve Clifford. No, not Steve Clifford. That's not fair, but. Uh, well, you're just not look, and you're not going college again, you know? No. So like, who are you, you know, who, who are you going with at this point? That, that's K- proven. KG is the answer to every question. Throw him enough money. KG. We'll KG. just get Kevin Garnett can be the the uh you know, like let him let him take over and see what no, I mean I I, I don't have a great answer for you there. It's just uh I don't know if there's there's anything, you know. You, you, there's no Doc Rivers Daryl Morey package out there that you're uh you're 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 plugging in and playing and that makes I don't sense. want a recycled guy. I don't want a recycled guy again and again and uh, worked out pretty good for Philly. Huh? Worked out pretty good for Philly. Yeah, he just needed a change of, of no, he, he's of proving that. out his own theory right now no question 
Right. You know? Exactly. Exactly. No, that, 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 that's, that's certainly working because we knew, listen, we knew if there was anybody that could broker the peace and not that they hated each other, but between Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid, like who better than Doc Rivers? Like nobody. There's nobody we trust more to figure out like the locker room and people more than Doc Rivers. If he invests the time to do it, which I think he's certainly done here in Philly because he's been invigorated. Right. He's been invigorated a little bit and and not having to deal with some of the other uh, the other stuff he had to deal with. All right. Well, listen, Chris, we appreciate it. I I am an NBA player who in the month of May has averaged 25 points, 15 rebounds, 11 assists a game. And I'm shooting 68 percent from the floor. But I am not Russell Westbrook. Who am I? 25, 11 rebounds? No, 15 rebounds, 11 assists. And I am shooting 0.679 from the floor. Hmm. I mean, Julius Randle's not at 11 assists. I've had such games as, oh, uh, 21, 15, uh, 21, 20, and 9. I've had another game, 32, 19, and 9. Um, I'll give you a hint. Um, I am a second-generation NBA player. Sabonis? Sabonis? Ooh. The modest Sabonis is having the quietest, spectacular month oh. in my career. I, don't, I, I, I took note of this the other day. This is in seven games in May. He's averaging 25, 15, 11, and shooting 68%. He's awesome. And another he play, awesome. another play in potential. That's right. That's right. And he was coming off injury, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, he missed him. He missed a lot of time. He missed a lot of time. I mean, that that's a team that honestly you could see if somehow there is a Brad Stevens component to this. <laughs> Pritchard and Danny should be talking a lot in the offseason. They really should. They should get together. I don't know where they want to meet. Maybe they can take in a, a Red Sox game or something on a nice day and uh, and just talk for a while and talk just see what it. comes of it. All right. I just wanted to get that one in there for you. Nice. This, it's a good stat. That it. is a good stat. It is a good stat. Chris, uh, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, honestly, so much fun to watch you now. Uh, getting rep upon rep upon rep. I'm almost tired about. of seeing you. I'm almost <laughs> tired. I think your wife is probably tired of seeing you on TV. But oh, 100%. No, you, no, you're honestly, I mean it like terrific job. I'm glad everything uh, has worked out so well for you. And uh, hopefully you'll get a, you know, interesting uh, off season. It'll start uh, a little bit earlier than you thought. I, I, I think <laughs> it'll be interesting is the right word. Thank you all. All right. So long, Chris. Chris Forsberg, NBC Sports Boston. Uh, We'll see you next week on the Ryan and Goodman podcast and uh, make sure you tune in every single week.